All right, three, two, one. Good afternoon, good evening, welcome to The Daily Objective. I'm Jonathan Hodig, delighted you're with us today for something interesting, something different. We're gonna talk a little bit about my experience, not just as an objectivist, uh, but as a professional, in fact, as a TV professional. Um, you know, uh, as they say, some of you might know me from appearances on everything from MTV to Fox News Channel. And I've been very fortunate as a student of objectivism to oftentimes bring a lot of these ideas and bring a lot of these passions of mine to some of those experiences. So uh, with you along here on the chat today, uh, uh, Daniel and many others, we're gonna take a look back at some of those highlights, a few lowlights as well, even I'll admit it, uh, and maybe uh, kind of take a walk down memory lane, learn some lessons as well. So I actually, I took the time to get the UK version of This Is Your Life. So we're gonna take a look at, I guess, not so much this is my life, but this was my, this is my TV life. Now it actually starts um, not so much even on, on Fox News Channel, but my TV career started way back in the 1990s, if you will. Many of you weren't even alive back then, but on a program here in the US uh, called, called Sneak Previews. Now Sneak Previews was a TV review show. This was actually where if you know Siskel and Ebert, they got their start on sneak previews. And sometime in the early 1990s, uh, they started a panel of teen movie reviewers. Now I was always kind of a hustler as a kid and I hustled for this job and I got it. And this was me in the early 1990s. Yeah. Then the panel met to dissect Medicine Man. Okay, oh, you oh, you, Medicine Man starring Sean Connery and Lorraine Bracco as two um, researchers in the Amazonian rainforest. Um, it just deals with a lot of issues involving environmentalism and the um, deforestation process and even the cure for cancer. But frankly, I just didn't, I, it didn't do anything for me. I didn't like it. I like no. the movie, but I would recommend it with some strong reservations. I mean, I think Lorraine Bracco was a good actress struggling with the bad script. I didn't like the way they made her strong and then ditzy one minute and it just didn't work for me. Right. I mean, she came with such like a, a very strong female character and then there was that one scene where she breaks down and cries like oh, a little baby. Come on. And that Barnes no. accent of hers got so annoying after a while. It was so overdone. I didn't care for that at all. So it's certainly always an opinionated little rat bastard of a kid and excited to have that opportunity. Um, and really enjoyed it. I mean, I remember uh, going to baseball games and, and stuff as a little kid and, or as a high school student, I should say, and people saying, oh, you know, I disagree with you about Bill and Ted's or whatever movie it was. So it was a great opportunity. And look, I grew up in a household in which having an opinion was really valued. And even as a child, you were asked to not only give your opinion or expected to give your opinion, but expected to give evidence. And I certainly was an object, I was not an objectivist as a child, uh, but scholarship was always applauded in my household. Debate was always applauded in my household. Uh, and on some level, I guess you could say communication was always uh, uh, applauded in my household. Now, um, my love, if you will, for kind of getting on TV was not satiated just yet. A few years later in high school, I actually got involved. I don't know what you call it in the UK. Here in the US, it's called public access. Um, video club is another way to look at it. It's basically where amateurs and beginners can kind of get their start in TV. And I, in fact, did that. This is going back to 1994. Uh, let's take a look at my first time kind of trying to be on TV uh, as a host. Hi, I'm Jonathan Honig. We're here at Jewett Field this morning for the Independence Day Family Day activities for the village of Deerfield. Uh, what's the best thing about the 4th of July for you? Fireworks. And you, my friend? Um, probably fireworks, too. What's your name, sir? David. David, could you name for me five American presidents? George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, uh, Come on, guys, help them out. They, they couldn't they could name it. They were, they were just kids at the time, so. We we'll cut him a little bit of slack, but it was it was certainly a lot of fun. And back then, you got to keep in mind in the early 1990s, there really wasn't um, there wasn't access to mass media the way there is now. There wasn't the ability to broadcast from a YouTube channel or anything like that. So even getting on like local TV and small town TV was 
was really exciting in every, every uh, opportunity. Now, I then went on to college and uh, um, took an opportunity to continue to get involved, not just in ideas, but also in mass media. And at, at the same time I was, at the same time I should say, I was really getting involved with the markets as well and started a radio show that anyone want to hit, guess what the radio show was called? Wait for it, wait for it. You're right, it was called Capitalist Pig. And the idea of Capitalist Pig was to merge my love of finance in the markets with who I was at the time, which was a kind of pop culture loving college kid. So um, that's where Capitalist Pig was born. I was a college student and I started a radio show. And one of my early guests uh, was a gentleman that you probably don't know in the UK, but his name is Fred Rerun Barry. If you've ever watched What's Happening, well, this was an example of what we did on those, let's see if we have it, those uh, early days of Capitalist Pig. 1232, back on AM 1000 and uh, Capitalist Pig with our special guest today, Fred Berry. Uh, of course, Fred Rerun Berry from What's Happening, and then, of course, the latter uh, success, What's Happening Now. Fred, welcome back. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> we want to talk uh, stocks and we want to talk about money because I know you are a registered representative, as you, as you noted earlier in the show. Right. Uh, you track the markets daily. I want to talk uh, about how you were able to get to the point. We'll talk stocks a little later in the show. Okay. How were you able to get to the point of, because I know you ran through a ton of money when you were younger. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've read in several news sources that you blew, some say, over a million dollars in liquor, women, houses, and the like. Yeah, a uh, uh, Learjet too. That costs a little bit. A Learjet. So that was kind of uh, what we did though in those days. Um, you know, interview celebrities about money, uh, sports people about money, strippers about money, and uh, taking a very irreverent look at at, at pop culture and uh, and the like. And that was again in the late 1990s. So that's really where my business, Capitals Pig. Right now, I'm a professional investor, but that's really where. Um, that was born. Now, at the time, you know, we have Cheddar. Cheddar is kind of a youth-oriented uh, personal finance uh, uh, network, as I understand it. And there's a lot of areas for that. But to give myself some credit, at the time, there really wasn't any voices for young people uh, talking about money. The idea was that, you know, older people, rich people invest in stocks. But in the late 1990s, 90s, there was kind of a revolution going on in the sense that the cost of trading was going down, the accessibility of trading was going up, and uh, more and more you were hearing people, uh, young people get involved with trading just as I was in my late teens, early 20s. Now, I'm gonna share with you the Iran Center UK audience because you are uh, been so generous with your super chats today and many days, so I wanna see a few more today, but I'm gonna show you never before seen my first, my first appearance on cable TV, this has never before been aired. I'm gonna air it for you. Uh, this is going back to 1996, my first appearance on cable TV as the host of Capitalist Pig Radio on a network that now doesn't even uh, exist anymore, CNN FM. Any uh, ambitions to spread your word through the World Wide Web? To the net, uh, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly a goal of ours. Um, it's uh, it's not been reached at this point, but um, there's you know there's so much terrific uh, information on the net regarding finance and investment. So I don't know if I what I could really add to that, but sure, internet, whatever. I mean, how friggin' stupid I have to say in 1996 saying, oh, there's so much great information on the internet. I don't. There's already so many great things out there. I mean, talk about having a closed mind. I hadn't really discovered Ayn Rand actually at that point. So in my own defense, but. Um, and really kind of caught the bug, obviously. And uh, around that same time, uh, someone called MTV came knocking. Now I had always been a big fan of MTV, uh, Eric Knees, The Grind, and many, many others. And um, I also around that time started trading and clerking at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So MTV wanted to come see that, they had heard about it. And uh, they came and found me, followed me in spring of 1996. I live with roommates, obviously, so we split the rent. And I don't have a car, which also may, I mean, a car is like a pretty serious expense. I don't need a car. 
I work uh, part-time at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I'm a clerk on the floor. It's not a stock exchange. It's a futures exchange. They trade futures contracts. Working at the Mercantile Exchange, uh, for me, is like it is the most exciting place on Earth. You're really standing in the middle of capitalism, and millions of dollars uh, are trading hands in the blink of an eye, and I could not imagine like a cooler place to spend an afternoon. I love it. The traders communicate through the use of... I had to say, so that really was... That was really true. I mean, I left college, not to bore you with my life story, although I guess that's what, the, what this is. Uh, I actually left college around that, not long after that, because my goal was to get on the floor of the exchange. I wanted to trade and kind of nothing, nothing was going to stop me. And around that time, I, uh, my radio show was taking off. I got a book deal at the time. Um, and I ended up leasing a seat at the exchange and leaving college not long after. Now, in my own, to my own credit, my, I think, broadcast shops were uh, getting a little bit better as well. I mean, that first time I was, my, I was, I was really nervous. I mean, I still get nervous being on TV, but um, I think my broadcast shops uh, improved a bit. And a year later was my first time, you might know Neil Cavuto from Fox Business and Fox News. A year later, I was invited on Neil Cavuto's show Fox News had just started, this was in 1997, for my first appearance with Neil Cavuto. And this was that. It's so good at this. I oh, do we have it? Do we have, do I, am I screen sharing the right thing? No, hold on, let me show you. Do we have, um, all right, good. Let's share it. All right. My first appearance. How did you get so good at this, at just knowing this? I know you took, what, one economics class, but you're yeah. obviously very well schooled in the ins and outs of Wall Street, the, the brokerage community. How did you get so knowledgeable? Well, you know, I'm obsessed, Neil. I must tell you. I mean, I wake up with the hang saying in the morning and I, uh, I go to sleep. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really into it. And uh, even to a point that I think most young people don't need to be it. I mean, the truth is, when, you, when it comes to your money, is that you don't need to be a financial expert. You need okay. to know a set of rules, a set uh, you know, of steps to take, procedures to take. Alrighty. And that's what Capital's Pig's about. Jonathan Honig, thank you very much for the Capital's Later, Pig. Later, Neil. Thank More you. So that was my first experience on, on cable news and, and a lot of fun at that. And you know, just as a quick side note, Neil has always been very generous with me, very great to me. He's a real Menchi guy. I actually think he's really sympathetic to Ayn Rand. Um, Neil has a religious background and a religious upbringing, um, but he's certainly a capitalist and he's always been very empathic to Ayn Rand's ideas. So, um, you know, I definitely kind of give him, salute him for that and for all the opportunities he's given me. So bring it back to where we are now in the saga, which is my mid-teens now, early, early to mid-teens. Um, the market was soaring. We're in the late 1990s. I have a book, which Money Magazine just named to be one of the top 10, I don't know, maybe five or 10 money books of the year. And uh, there was a very popular show at the time on ABC called Politically Incorrect. And it was supposed to be just that, kind of a debate about political issues with celebrities, with kind of authors, offbeat people hosted by Bill Maher. And uh, I got the call that they wanted me to appear. You'll see who I appeared with. And just to give you a kind of, you might not remember this, but this was in 1999 in the midst of some major riots. I don't know what other word to describe, but riots in Seattle uh, around the World Trade Organization before um, Antifa, before Black Bloc, before all that stuff. This was really the early days of that, at least in the US. We had never really seen this before. Um, so as that was exploding, I was flown out to uh, Los Angeles. Yes, I guess Los Angeles, driven to ABC, got into the green room and uh, Debbie Harry was there. I don't know, from, from Blondie. She wasn't on the show, but she was there and sat down to tape uh, Politically Incorrect with Michael Moore and Bill Maher. I think I'm with everybody else. I'd never heard of the WTO before this week and they started firing tear gas. Thought it was a football league. I <laughs> thought it was wrestling. Uh, the Canadian rock group. But let's talk about who is protesting, okay? Because it is a really unholy amalgam. It is a, talk about strange bedfellows. The people who are against the World Trade Organization, the Rainforest Action Network, the AFL-CIO, the Humane Society, 
Pat Buchanan. <laughs> Uh, you know, you don't and see them on they, the news. Why are they so upset? Why are Just to, to bore you with this, but Michael Moore makes excuses for these people. I say they should all be arrested, and I still say they should all be arrested, and Michael Moore makes excuses for them. So that didn't change, but that definitely ignited my love for political debate. And around the same time, I had this is the late 1990s, I had started really getting into Ayn Rand. And I got into it, like many people do, through the politics um, but it began my experience as a student of objectivism and as a, as a passionate objectivist and lover of Ayn Rand's work. And, to just, uh, and as you'll see now, as these clips go on, you'll hear more and more objectivism in, in a lot of what I'm saying. Now, I want to get to Ed, who uh, gave us, blessed us with a super chat. Thank you so much, Ed. Ed asks, Having worked as a voice trader on the CME, what is your opinion of electrification of trading venues? I guess what you mean is, you know, is it better now that we all we trade by computer as against in the pit? Um, look, I did a whole film about trading in the pit, pittrading101.com. I did a book about it, thepitchicago.com. Um, I it was one of the most formative, amazing experiences of my life but it's much better now. It's a much better time to be an investor now as a result of the electron, electrification, as you say, as a, as, a result, as a result of electric trading, electronic trading. Uh, there's never been a better time actually to be an investor. It's never been cheaper, faster, more efficient. There's never been more markets are able to trade. So I miss those old days. I'm glad I had the experience, um, but I, you know, we're, we're much better now, if you will, as markets. Markets are much, I think, safer now as a result of high-speed trading and electric trading. And it's certainly preferable for us as investors to be able to push a button and get a fill as against calling someone, waiting on hold, write it down, run it down. I mean, it's, believe me, I, no one's more, um, no one has more nostalgia for it than I, but we're, we're much better now as, as a result. All right, let's let's uh, kind of take take you up now in chron chronology. We're in uh, 2000. The Nasdaq, guess what, is hitting all time highs. Does that sound familiar? And I have since gotten myself a job on a local TV station here in Chicago, reporting from the, the markets and reporting on the Nasdaq hitting a then record high of 45 on capitalist pig now, Jonathan Honig. He has all the latest money news. Jonathan, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Darlene. So you're hey, big Mike? on the boiler room, huh? Oh, gotta see boiler room, gotta see boiler room. It sounds like it's, you know, the Wall Street over room, our day. You'll definitely be yeah. checking that out. Right up your alley. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll tell you, Mike, the tech stocks have, you know, as you know, I've been on fire. It's like neither rain nor sleet nor snow. Nothing will keep tech stocks down. And that's... Isn't that funny? That was 20 years ago. Nothing will keep tech stocks down. Uh, just as a interesting. Now I want to show one more from that era. We were also talking about something called the Y two K problem. Yesterday, back then. they're Remember ready that? to rock at the New York Stock Exchange. Probably ready to go at the Chicago Board of Trade. So people ask me, what did you do on the Millennium Return? Well, we we have been in contact with representatives from all the major Chicago futures exchanges, where electronic trading has actually already been underway for several hours. They're reporting no problems, night. although once again, we certainly won't be sure until tomorrow morning. I'll keep an eye on the situation and have a, a full report in the morning. There had to be a certain amount of money sitting on the sidelines, investors waiting to see what would happen. Now that we know all is well, is the market as a whole, in your opinion, poised to set some more records in the coming month it, or it, months? It would be nice, Nancy. It would be nice. The stock market rang out the new year with record highs and unprecedented gains, especially in technology. I mean, the NASDAQ gained 85% in 1999. Analysts I talked to on the street are predicting solid, albeit a little less spectacular gains in the months to come. January is a key month. Interesting. So the market actually went up 85%. The Nasdaq went up 85% that year in 1999. Still the biggest chain, uh, percentage gain ever for a major market index. It went up 20% more in the first quarter of the next year than it fell 70% and, and didn't come back for a decade. Thank you, Emmanuel. I really appreciate your support of the Ayn Rand Center UK. Thank you, Mary Aline. Always appreciate your support of the Ayn Rand Center UK. Thank you, Daniel. You guys are you're, you're, uh, honoring me with your generous contributions for the Ayn Rand Center. So thank you so much. Now, my work is as an investor. I've actually never been, I think, particularly good on t television. Uh, you know, I'm not that beautiful. I follow, 
I used to have a joke. Well, I have an off color joke that I'm not going to tell just yet, but about the rules of television, but I'll just say my real job is obviously that of an investor. And um, by 2000, I'll give myself a little bit of credit by 2000, I was already seeing something happening to the market. So let me take you now back to March of 2000 on Fox and Friends. Leon, Leon has got a question for uh, the pig and the Kramer. What's your question? How do I get some of that palm stock? Yeah, she wants herself some palm. Well, they're um, going to be serving it to you in spades today. The stock's up too high. I would hold off. You'll be able to buy it two weeks from now at a lower price. Okay. I think, unfortunately, as most of us at Street.com know, IPOs have a habit of starting very high and going very low. You take a look at the Globe.com, you take a look at Palm, you take a look at VA Linux. I mean, Jim, you know these stocks, uh, they price at 15, they open 130, and they go nowhere down but there. Absolutely. He's got it right. Okay. So that was, and that was I mean, the trend was already starting to change, and, and that's what I was re referring to then. And you know, this is not a comment on today's market, but um, you know. so... That started a great relationship with Fox News and Fox Business in particular. And um, now you might not know who Gallagher is, uh, you in the UK. Gallagher is a, well, he's a prop comedian here in the United States. And uh, I quickly kind of gained a reputation as being the so-called Gallagher of the financial world. I'm joking a little bit, but I, I started to have a reputation for bringing in props, but hopefully bringing in props to make a point. And one of those, one of, I always say one of my favorite appearances was when I, I made the point, I believe, with actually Jean Janine Pirro, Justice Jean Pirro, what is her name, Janine Pirro, that a dog is property. And that, well, I'll let, I'll let the tape speak for itself. Wait, oh, wait, sorry, I'm not sharing. Sorry, I was supposed to share. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's. Right. If you were slitting their stomachs open, come, yeah, come on, Jonathan, come on, come on. Oh, you come on. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I, I love animals, right, Terry? This is Snacky Dog. This is my pooch here. And I love animals, but <laughs> animals don't have rights, Gina. I'm sorry. I mean, the whole notion of outlawing an activity towards an animal is absurd. Uh, I don't know how many of your clients happen to be cute dogs or, or cats, but animals don't have any rights. All right, All right. And well, Jonathan, and Jonathan, let me just point out, we can, we can show your cute little dog there, but we, we can't even show the video of what went on with these cows. I mean, it's too horrifying to show. Well, I Jonathan, let me tell you why you're wrong. You're wrong because every state... Anyway, that was kind of began a real fun uh, challenge for me in trying to integrate objectivist principles oftentimes in the span of a very short, forgive me, I'm fixing my, my light here, and in oftentimes very short TV appearances. Um, I'll give you another example. Here's one. Um, certainly where Ms. Rand influenced me is on the issue of national security. And around then, and then now we're in the middle of the 2000s, uh, we were fighting a so-called war on terror. And there was a lot of discussion of that and consternation over that. And at one point, there was an emphasis made that we need to have a coalition, that we couldn't actually act in America's self-interest until we had a a coalition, and uh, this was some of our discussion on the program at that time. About Raqqa, I mean, Raqqa is the is the uh, headquarters, is the base for the Islamic State. Why don't we take out, you know, 10, 15 blocks and say, unless you stop, there's more of this to come. Why, and that's the point we've been well, trying to make. What, hold on, Lisa. Why, what about Raqqa? What about some of the training facilities? We, uh, we have very good intel that shows us exactly where they are. We know where their headquarters are. We know where they train people. We know where they teach people. Why not wipe those out? I think cojones. I mean, the ground in the Middle East, North Where's Africa, it? and they now have, the, you know, they're now have a presence wait, wait, in over a say, dozen we don't, countries. We don't, we, don't need, we don't need a coalition. We just need cojones. I mean, this whole idea of we just need to <laughs> degrade, not destroy the enemy. The whole purpose of winning a war is to end the war and to win it. So, you know, we just keep playing. And that, a lot of that material was really influenced by Rand's perspective on the Middle East, Rand's perspective on uh, war in general, um, and those are issues that are still gonna, gonna continue. This now, I'm, I guess now we're playing, hopefully this is, this has uh, switched over. Let's just kill that for now. Um, 
this, I wanted to just bring, happened to be a, uh, the Tea Party speech. And thank you, Zalmi. Zalmi is long GameStop. So making a lot of money. We appreciate that uh, for sharing some of your winnings. This is uh, in, the, in the mid 2000s, there was a bunch of protests. They called them Tea Party protests. Uh, here in the United States. And it actually inspired a, a pretty effective political movement for about 15 minutes. I was a speaker at one of the early Tea Party protests, and I hope you guys can see this. I'm actually holding up a sign here that says, who is John Galt? Uh, and there was a lot of that at that time. There was a lot of emphasis on individualism. And in fact, my speech, um, which we can play just a minute of, was about individualism. Yeah. Yeah. Real, real honor to be here. I'm the finance guy, as you all know. So it's uh, my job to report some very disturbing, frightening statistics. And we talked about all the spending that government was doing. The irony is that that, and thank you, Sam Steers for five pounds. Sam says, thank you, Mr. Honig. I'm currently reading Greed is Good. I know it's old, but it's still a great read and very insightful. Thank you very much for that kind note and, and for the support and just for being here as well. So I'm delighted that was, uh, uh, so now we're in the mid 2000s. Uh, we were talking about being against bailouts. Um, there's some videos I can share of that of you about some of the bailouts. Uh, and you know, the thing about me at this point is I was certainly me well-versed in principles. And you know, Rand always talks about thinking in principles. And um, I understood why bailouts were bad for uh, homeowners and banks for insurance companies and hedge funds. Um, and that idea of thinking in principles was something that certainly Ms. Rand taught me. And uh, um, you know, I've, I've, it's helped me as a thinker. It helped me as an investor and certainly as a, as a TV pundit, if you will, ever since. It's just helped me as a thinker. I wanted to share one of my favorite clips. Now, I'm since a little bit more mixed on Art Laffer. Um, but Art Laffer, who was a really, very well-known free market economist, uh, appeared around this time, I guess this is about 2012, uh, he appeared on uh, Fox Business right after I'd made an argument for free markets and deregulation. Art Laffer is here with three things President Obama has to do right now. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for coming on. Um, what, you've heard everything we've been talking about so far. Before I get to your three things, are we, you know, we hear about France being downgraded. Is that where we're headed? Yes, that's where we're headed. Oh. But I just love Jonathan. He's just perfect on everything. I, I couldn't have, I mean, he was really great. Yeah. No, but it, that's right. I mean, we're moving in that direction, yeah. obviously. And Hollande, I mean, <laughs> the joke I tell is that. We're looking at a shot of him celebrating. He's so happy that you're giving him a plug. Anyway, no, we are. We oh, are headed. He? Oh, I didn't. I can't see that. Well, he, he really is good, by the way. Yeah. He, he's a great guy. Well, Let me thank you. Thank you, Art Laffer, for saying that. And uh, I guess I'm glad he got a he got a presidential medal of freedom. Um, here's one I'll share. That is pretty relevant now. Back then, around that time in the in the two thousands, uh, there was the issue of Obamacare. Now, you guys have had a long history of socialized health care. I know in the UK, that's kind of many, as I understand it, many in the UK are somewhat proud of it. But even getting so called Obamacare was a, a real struggle in the United States. Now, they got it pushed through. Very few people were advocating against Obamacare. Now. Many on the right were advocating against Obamacare on fiscal reasons. They said, oh, we can't afford it. You know, it's going to bankrupt. They would say, look at NHS. NHS is bankrupt. We can't afford this. And I mean, it fell on friggin' deaf ears, of course, but I'll share with you a, a bit of tape that um, I got a lot of heat for at the time, but I absolutely stand by this. Um, asking, you know, when asked about and, and well, I'll just say it has to do with Joe Biden, then Vice President Joe Biden. This is on the issue of, uh, of, of Obamacare. Now, Jonathan, <laughs> you're not calming down, right? Uh, Neil, I'm not. In fact, both Joe Biden and Barack Obama have made it very clear that they support socialized health care. In fact, they think that health care is a right. And I think it shows a real ignorance as to what a right actually is. I mean, a right is a right to action. It's not to a freebie from someone else. That's straight up objectivism, a right is a right to action. It's not it's not a freebie for someone else. And it's almost verbatim from Dr. Peikoff's article on healthcare is not a right. 
that was a major influence on me. And I'm really happy and excited I was able to introduce some of these ideas into the conversation. I don't know how far it got us, but that's certainly influenced by Dr. Pico. A right actually is. I mean, a right is a right to action. It's not to a freebie from someone else. And I know it sounds kind of curt in this age of political correctness and altruism, but why should I be responsible for paying for Joe Biden's brain aneurysms? <laughs> so, it is sounds a little curt. Joe Biden, then vice president, had had a couple of brain aner aneurysms. And why should I be responsible or you be responsible for paying for anyone else's health maladies? Um, you know, your life is your own. My life is my own. You pay for your own and um, you help out those in need if charitably, if you so think so. But um, that was a, I got a lot of flack at the time because that altruism of, of course, you've got to help, you know, not just help your neighbor, but be forced to at gunpoint. Um, that was just baked into the cake in the U.S. And of course, that's what ultimately got uh, Obamacare uh, passed. Um, but thankfully, I was still able to kind of integrate some objectivist ideas now and then, explicitly oftentimes. Uh, in 2016, when it became clear actually that even the right at that point had really become altruist, um, I wanted to try to have the opportunity to make the point that sacrifice is wrong. You know, I mean, the whole idea of the Tea Party in, in America was that you shouldn't have to sacrifice for other people who didn't, who made poor decisions. And I tried to make that point even as, uh, as, uh, as uh, well, first Joe, uh, John McCain, who had country first, but then Barack Obama, or excuse me, then um, Donald Trump, who had country first. My point was hopefully, no, it's you first. It's your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in America. I, I, just wish, I just wish there really was Americanism out there, Eric. I think both parties, unfortunately, have it wrong. I mean, the left, it's all about I am my brother's keeper. On the right, it's all about country first. The whole point of Americanism is that you own your life. It's your life, your liberty, your, ha your happiness. You're not a sacrifice Which to anyone else. Well, I think right. these kids have a lot You're not a death. sacrifice to anyone else. I mean, that's, it sounds... I mean, frankly, it was kind of shocking then, and you know, and I don't want to kind of bring us out on a downer now, but it's even more shocking now. Altruism is so baked into the cake. Now, we're not going to get too much into politics today, but I want to share one clip because when Donald Trump kind of first came on the scene, uh, some people tried to make the case that Donald Trump was, and I'm not shitting you here, a modern day Ayn Rand. And um, I was on a panel. I'm going to share that panel now, and I'm going to spare you the first minute and a half. But they had me on a panel with two other gentlemen, and one of the gentlemen quotes Atlas Shrugged. And then after quoting it, he also says that he's never actually read it. So now you're going to hear me responding to that from December 2016. Of an Ayn Rand hero know how it's going to turn out yet? No. Right, but of course it's not. It's long due that can we I try just, to do I, something like this and John, with this kind of talent. Let John, Jonathan, please. Can, well, but before our guest quotes Atlas Shrugged, does, don't you think he should at least finish it? I mean, tr Trump is the opposite of an Ayn Rand hero. He is completely opposed, Charles, to everything objectivism stands for, everything Ayn Rand wrote about. Forget even capitalism. I mean, he, he talked in the New York Times a, a couple days ago about he's against free markets. Even something as metaphysically well, basic. I don't, I don't basic think he ever said he was against free markets, Jonathan. I think he's against he, the way free markets Charles, have evolved under, Charles, under American leadership. Charles, he talked. As you can see, that I actually got in primacy of existence because I wanted to make the point that he just did, he denies reality. So it's a good opportunity to be able to kind of get some of those principles in. One more, well, I'll share one more. Uh, Daniel is asking about an appearance that I made where I, and you can Google it, it's me endorsing uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016, which I did and which I stand by. I don't have it queued up here, but I stand by. Um, you know, as uh, 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 we can talk about that another time um, and why I did that and why I actually stand by that. I think we would have been a lot better off. Look, we spent four years bitching about Hillary Clinton anyway, and Trump destroyed what was left of the, left of the Republican Party and put free market capitalism back by decades and decades. So I stand by that, especially when you see who the president actually installed as his, uh, as his gatekeepers. Um, here's one more I'll share. You know, again, we don't want to make this uh, political. We just have a few seconds left. But 
talk about primacy of consciousness versus primacy of existence, tariffs are paid by the country, the people in the country who had opposed them. And one of the things that frustrated me a lot in recent years was this primacy of consciousness among many in the Trump camp, including President Trump himself and his senior advisors, in particular about something that was important, it is important to me, which is trade. So I was able to ask, I think pretty bluntly, Peter Navarro, who, who pays tariffs? And here was his non-answer. Since then, the first Puerto Rican question out of the money coming into Treasury, where is so, that coming from? So, so, uh, when we have imposed tariffs, where's that money coming from? Iron and steel, uh, it comes from the people who pay the tariffs. Now, I know you're going to say it's probably consumers where it's coming from, well, but that's is not it coming from Americans. If, if, is the tax coming from Americans, sir? Uh, you know how tariffs work? Do you? I'm asking you, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What well, maybe has been paying that money? Tell, tell me how you think it works in the border. Well, are yeah. Americans paying the tariffs? Yeah. 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 in the Treasury. Yeah. Is that coming uh, from Americans? Simple well, question, sir. I, I would guess that you were on a debating team somewhere in high school or maybe college. This conversation has no utility at all to me. Okay, sir. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to and uh, despite Peter's Navarro refusal to see it. So thank you for uh, joining me this afternoon or this morning. This has been a lot of fun to be able to kind of uh, live back through some of these memories and share them with you. It's been a real pleasure over my 20 something year career to be able to integrate a lot of objectivist ideas because I think they're right, because I think they're true uh, because they've really helped me, you know what I mean? It's not about, as we always say, as I always say, it's not about winning an argument on Facebook or proving yourself right amongst friends. It's about using these ideas to live the, your best life and living a happy life and a fulfilled life. And you know, we haven't even gotten into how objectivism has really helped me with that in my business. And maybe we'll do that at another time. So, um, but this is just a, a few examples of how I've been able to integrate some of these ideas into my TV appearances. I'm a student of objectivism. I think we, you, that's exactly what you should be. Don't, there's no pressure to be an objectivist, be a student. There's so much to read. There's so much Ayn Rand to explore. That's what we're doing here at the Ayn Rand Center UK. So um, thank you for making us part of your day. Now in 20 minutes, don't touch this dial because in 20 minutes live on this channel, you are not gonna wanna miss this. A discussion with James Valiant on the robber barons and an interview with Ayn Rand. Really, I mean, James is brilliant. He really knows his, his stuff when it comes to Rand. So don't, uh, don't miss that. Subscribe, share, and um, make us part of your day and support us. I mean, five pounds goes a long way. Um, and it, it, it's a lot of intellectual fuel and, and enthusiasm for us to keep doing what we're doing. So thank you so, so much. Stay tuned, subscribe. We're gonna have James Valiant coming up. Thank you to Christopher, to Mary Oline, to Eric, um, Daniel. Yes, Daniel, people should like. I mean, that doesn't cost you shit, honestly. I mean, just do this. You're gonna do that anyway. So just do it on the like button. It means a lot to us. Um, and thank you again for making us part of your afternoon. We'll be back here all throughout the week for more of the Ayn Rand Center UK and the Daily Objective. Be well.